September the 22nd marks the anniversary of the Iraq-Iran War of 1980, when Iran found itself isolated against the aggressor Saddam Hussein, who had a world behind him. But the day is matched by the National Day of Defense Industry, marked on August the 22nd this year. That's a healthy antidote to a bitter memory the country is determined not to see any time soon. With over 40 years of sanctions, including eight years of war, Iran understood the importance of military independence. But how deterring is our military program and is it economically justified? For answers, stay with me, Leila Faromarzi on Iran Today. Military self-sufficiency for survival is a mantra set deep in the Iranian psyche. How Iran has gone about attaining self-sufficiency is by indigenizing defense technologies and benefiting from talented youth's manpower in the armed forces. Much attention has been paid to creating and expanding a missile arsenal. Mr. Korsari is an MP and retired IRGC commander. He shared his experiences with us in Parliament, where we went to meet him. Why has this country focused so much on missiles? If we didn't have it, they would have certainly destroyed us. You need to act with power against bullies and aggressors. There's no room for a negotiation with someone who doesn't understand the language of logic. Look at Afghanistan. They admitted to killing children under the pretext of targeting Daesh and Al-Qaeda terrorists. They don't understand anything. They believe everything has to be in their interests. But that couldn't be any further from the truth. God has created everyone equal. Mr. Khoshchesh is a senior political analyst and familiar face on Press TV. He joined us on Skype this time. Threats, military threats against Tehran uh, are now part of the U.S. Uh, uh, strategy, permanent strategy, in order to subdue Tehran. Therefore, they have left Iran with no other choice but to reinvigorate itself, especially considering that Iran has been under toughening sanctions and uh, many war powers have defied helping Iran with military tools and equipment, therefore forcing Iran to develop its arms program which actually started during the eight-year-long war imposed by former Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein uh, when Iran uh, was uh, not even provided by, uh, you know, the most simple weapons and tools. When Iran intended to import barbed wires, they never allowed Iran and they confiscated two cargoes, two, drug, uh, two trucks, uh, alongside borders of uh, CIS countries in the north of Iran uh, and Iran was under tough sanctions during the eight-year-long war. The missile program is the cornerstone of Iranian defense strategy and deterrence. It emerged after Iran acquired the art of reverse engineering missiles it had acquired from different sources. Effective deterrence capability should be economic justification enough for the missile program. During Operation Khaybar in 1984, in the Talaya area, the 27th Division was commanded by Haj Ibrahim Hamad, who was martyred during the same operation. He was a teacher before the Islamic Revolution and used to run away from Savak. He was under considerable pressure there, as there were many injured and martyrs and the Iraqis were repelling their attacks. It got to a point where Hassan Tehrani Mugaddam known as the father of Iran's missile program, who was a student at the time, got to the front line. He used to monitor the news and knew that we were under tremendous pressure there. I was helping Haj Ahmad, who was the commander. Tehran Muqaddam promised to bring in a missile and target the Iraqis' fortifications so we could advance. The next morning, he brought a Toyota with a metal beam welded on the back and a missile on top. He fired a missile, which flew about four meters and landed in front of the Toyota. We were shocked by what happened and asked him what went wrong. He said, I make missiles. That was in 1984. 
He resolutely continued his work and made better missiles later. Thanks to the U.S. drones, sophisticated drones like um, uh, RQ Sentinel 160s, 170, Scan Eagle, MQ4, MQ9, or, or Reaper, all other types, different types of U.S. Uh, sophisticated drones that Iran has hunted and uh, brought down and reverse engineered and reproduced all of them. Iran is now able to, you know, it has actually manufactured different kinds of drones, very advanced drones that are radar evading. Uh, Iran has developed the needed uh, geometrical shape, the coating, the uh, structure and the texture of uh, the body and the wings that are needed. Uh, these are different systems used for radar evading aircraft and drone and Iran has developed this technology through reverse engineering the captured U.S. drones. Iran is now equipped with the most sophisticated drone technology and the CENTCOM commander of the United States said just a few weeks ago that they have lost superiority in the Middle East because of the U.S. drone, because of Iranian drones. Sanctions against armed forces in Iran and the defense industry are not new. The Air Force, a conventional force, has also been subject to harsh sanctions for many years. Where negotiations for sanctions lifting might fail, Iran turns to neutralizing sanctions by boosting its industry. It's not just arms and missiles. Communications networking is itself a power factor in modern wars. And the Ministry of Defense boasted in August that it had managed to localize communications networks in the country. Presently, we have established fair cooperation and collaboration with 600 academic centers and 900 knowledge-based companies in line with meeting demands of the armed forces in relevant fields. This, the chief executive of Electronic Industries Organization of the Ministry of Defense said. That's Brigadier General Shahrukh Shahram. Iran's military history is as old as global civilization itself. This country is known to have created the world's first empire 2,500 years ago, a benevolent empire. And so, it's perfectly aware of the importance of arms. But given Iran's position in the world of today, and the fact that it's ruled by religious doctrine, makes it care more for defense, rather defense and deterrence. Chief of Staff of Iran's Armed Forces, Major General Mohammad Bareli said that the policy of the Armed Forces is to increase the ability to attack the centers of threats. His statement released on the occasion of the anniversary of National Day of Defense Industry read, Increasing the ability to attack the centers of threat against the Islamic country is a strategic, unstoppable policy of the Armed Forces. As a soldier during the war, to what extent did you feel the lack of equipment? It was so severe, both in terms of weapons and ammunition. We would take most of them from Iraqis themselves because they were backed by dollars coming from Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Qatar and Kuwait. Our personnel would cover their shortages from them. Syria was the only country that sold us weapons until the very end of the war. Although Libya worked with us in the first three, four years, and North Korea sold us weapons in the last three, four years. The Islamic Republic believes it has aimed straight for military self-sufficiency, looking at its achievements in strengthening foundations of the resistance front, as well as expanding its defense capability beyond Iranian borders. Its armed forces and defense sector can be taken as a centerpiece of security and stability in the region. Iranian commanders believe the country's military self-sufficiency has reached such a level that the courage to attack Iran doesn't exist. The accuracy of Iranian missiles in attacking, say, ISIS can serve as proof. The IRGC or Revolution Guard Corps launched the Permanent Aerospace Fair showcasing ballistic missiles in September 2020. I will go on to 2021 as well. There it unveiled its third-generation naval strike ballistic missile. It showcased the Zolfagare Basir missile with a range of more than 700 kilometers as its new generation ballistic missile. The newest projectile is fitted with a warhead that is guided by an optical seeker head. The country has deployed Zolfagare Basir against overseas targets, such as gatherings of the terror group Daesh. 
as well as the United States in Al-Assad Air Base in Iraq. That was targeted after the U.S. assassination of Qasem Soleimani, Iran's top anti-terror general. Other capabilities demonstrated in the exhibition were UAVs, satellites, defense systems, reconnaissance apparatus, and electronic warfare, as well as some of the invading drones that were shot down by the Corps in the past, including American and Israeli ones. More on military equipment and missiles after a quick diversion into world media. To have a look at what other outlets have to say, I invite you indoors. And here's how they word it. We've got Tasnim news and an expression of determination. Iran's new defense minister vows to build up IRGC's military power. The new defense minister of Iran pledged that his ministry will do its utmost to boost the capabilities of the Islamic Revolution Guard Corps. In a meeting with the IRGC commander, Major General Hossein Salami in Tehran, Defense Minister Brigadier General Mohammad Reza Ashtiani reaffirmed the Defense Ministry's full support for all armed forces of the country, highlighting the need for a revolutionary approach in the military sector coupled with the continuation of the previous efforts the general said the Defense Ministry will employ all of its capacities to deepen and boost the defense capabilities and fulfill the needs of the armed forces, specifically the IRGC, including by supplying modern and strategic systems and equipment. Brigadier General Ashtiani stressed that coordination, synergy and convergence among Iranian military units will ensure the fulfillment of the strategic needs of the armed forces and strengthening of the defense power. Tehran Times tells of an unprecedented show of military capability. Iran sets foot in backyard of the U.S. Now, with a serious test of Iran's naval capability for a long-term mission in distant waters, Iran has set its feet in the backyard of the Americans in the North Atlantic Ocean or any other body of water in the world. The 75th Naval Fleet of the Army, consisting of Macron Big Ship and Sahan Destroyer, finally entered the territorial waters of Iran in the past few days after 133 days of navigation and 44,000 kilometers of sea route in the most unprecedented mission in the history of Navy of Iran's army and docked in Bandar Abbas. What sets this mission distinct from its previous 74 missions is not only the long without docking journey along the route, but also Iran's first presence in the North Atlantic, which has always been considered the backyard of the United States, Britain and France. That would be it for the news section, but do stay tuned, more of the program coming up. Iran's ballistic missile systems, supplemented by cruise missiles and UAVs, are intended for deterrence, but can be used for battle. This is complemented by asymmetric warfare tactics. Israel may have over 200 nuclear warheads, but their troops on the ground wouldn't have much to say for themselves. Look at its recent war with Lebanon. Anyhow. Not yet fully provoked, Iran has kept its ballistic missiles down at a range limit of 2,000 kilometers. Its priority is to improve precision rather than increase range, notable in several missile systems. Say, the Qiyam-1 is an 800-kilometer range variant of the Shahab-2 short-range ballistic missile with a 500-kilogram separable warhead and ground-based guidance augmentation. A modified version of the Qiyam, which appears to have a maneuverable re-entry vehicle to further improve its accuracy, was used in the January 2020 attack against Ain al-Assad Air Base in Iraq. The Emad is based on the longer-range Qad-1 variant of the Shahab-3 medium-range ballistic missile and has claimed a range of 1,800 kilometers. It is also equipped with a separating MARV. The Rode Mobile solid fuel short range ballistic missiles of the Fateh family have evolved both in range and in accuracy. 
They have evolved in range from about 300 kilometers to a claimed 1,400 kilometers and in accuracy by means of the incorporation of terminal guidance, including an anti-ship version. The system, third of Khordat, uh, is uh, you know so popular now among the world armies that they have requested Iran to you know uh, supply them with this kind of air defense shield and also the missile Sayyad that was used to bring down that aircraft uh, is now requested by uh, some countries. Uh, some of these systems have been you know taken to Syria and deployed in there in order to be integrated into the Syrian air defense shield now. So Iran has spread and developed its uh, air defense points from a few to 3,000 now. And in the near future, Iran plans to increase it to five to 6,000 uh, points. So there is no place left uh, you know, in Iran that could be targeted by anyone, by any kind of aircraft. The Iranian radars and air defense shields can identify targets from a range of 3,000 kilometers away as soon as they, you know, start flying. The Fateh family also shows the important strides Iran has taken in solid propellant missiles. Their advantage is because of their launch preparation time, which is much shorter. Iran's long-term missile development priorities will focus on missiles powered by solid propellants. Those overcome the operational and performance limitations of the country's liquid propellant systems. The emphasis on precision, together with the move towards solid propellants, is combined clearly in the Fateh family of short-range ballistic missiles. The country is having rolled out three new Fateh variants, Zolfagar, Desful and Haj Ghasem, over only four years is a remarkable development. If prevention is better than cure, deterrence comes before defense. And Iran is continuing to develop and introduce armed UAVs and cruise missiles. UAVs being unmanned aerial vehicles. Iran has built warships, destroyers, it's working on submarines. The, the um, Navy commanders say if the country feels the need for long distance deployment, then they are very much able to even produce aircraft carriers. Major General Hossein Salami of the IRGC said, we can hit moving targets in the ocean from the heart of our land. That would mean targeting aggressive aircraft carriers and warships by long-range ballistic missiles. It is usual to hit moving targets in the sea by low-speed cruise missiles. But using long-range missiles is a great defense breakthrough for us because we can hit moving targets in the ocean from the heart of our land, he said. Military self-sufficiency is warranted by having your own military equipment, but you've also got to have your own people to strategize and put the equipment to use. Missiles aside, another crucial dimension of Iran's defenses is its asymmetric war doctrine. That aims to avoid direct confrontation with the enemy by using surprise and deception and creating a complex battlefield to make sustainable operations difficult for the adversary. This asymmetric or mosaic defense doctrine in Iran was evolved by 2005, after the 2003 invasion of Iraq when Iran saw the U.S. practically on its own doorstep. Since 2012, Iran has been adding an offensive dimension by adopting hybrid warfare. Known as the forward defense doctrine, it recommends fighting opponents off outside Iran's borders before they get too close. What the United States is Iran's arch foe. Israel is another arch foe. And they are armed to the teeth. When Iran started its arms development program, it was under sanctions. Nobody helped Iran. Iran was not able to produce even mortars or bullets or individual arms, sophisticated arms for soldiers uh, decades ago. While the Americans had the, you know, they enjoyed the most sophisticated arms uh, uh, that any power or any country could have. So Iran was thinking of how it can defuse the threats of Israel and the United States in the short, shortest time possible. And then they went, they went after asymmetrical warfare and they developed 
asymmetrical warfare techniques, tactics, and gradually it became a doctrine. Pre-revolution in the 1970s, Iran was undergoing a massive modernization program under the Shah. Its armed forces were being equipped with mostly American and British manufactured equipment. But with the revolution, orders or deliveries were cancelled by Western suppliers. It appeared that before the Islamic revolution, the US and Europe would provide Iran with whatever weapons and arms we wanted. But the reality was that the Iranian military personnel couldn't use the equipment and weapons that much. We saw they couldn't do anything against the Iranian people. They didn't have much capability to fight the enemies either. As we have seen throughout history, including under Reza Pahlavi's rule during World War II, the British invaded Iran from the south, the Russians from the north, and Iran's military didn't put up much resistance. Iran did not have to rebuild its defense capabilities entirely from scratch, but it required strategic redirection. That would be to apply the revolutionary ideals of independence and self-reliance to defense. The problems of military dependence can be demonstrated by referring to the recent events in Afghanistan. When American maintenance services to the Afghan army were cut off, it could no longer use the world's most advanced fighters and helicopters. Many of these weapons are unused in Afghanistan today. Also, fighter jets delivered to Arab countries are in the same situation and cannot be used without U.S. permission and guidance. The billions of dollars the U.S. and NATO spent on the Afghan military on training and equipping it could not fix major internal flaws. And on August the 15th, the Taliban simply captured the Afghan capital Kabul and announced the war in Afghanistan is over. Finally, I want to say that the same situation persists in Afghanistan today. The Americans stationed their troops in Afghanistan and according to their estimates, pay $2 trillion for establishing a so-called peace. However, the main objective wasn't to empower Afghanistan, but to establish a base for them in an area between China, Russia, India and Iran to keep an eye on them. In Iran, pre-1979, Mohammad Reza Shah the king paid up front for his whopping load of military equipment. But even that was denied Iran after the revolution. Not just that, here's what happened to thousands of tanks bought from Britain. Iran had paid for them in the 1970s, but they were sold on to Iraq. So during the war of the 1980s, Iran was turned on by its own tanks, basically. Also, Iran's air force had to learn how to keep its large fleet of US-built aircraft and helicopters operational single-handedly. And so this country began establishing its own aerospace industry. Also, Iran has developed its own uh, force generation aircraft uh, uh, for combat and for surveillance as well as training. Um, it, uh, uh, this has happened through a self-sufficiency plan and move. Also, Iran has made a conceptual model of fifth generation uh, aircraft. That's the most modern aircraft in the world. There are only 10 types of fifth generation aircraft. And the Iranian one is the fifth one. Of course, it's a conceptual model. But the most important feature in this kind of aircraft is their radar evading feature. Former Iranian Defense Minister Brigadier General Hatami stated, Today, we have gained various achievements in different fields, which are not limited to ground combat. And in the field of missiles, we are undoubtedly one of the world's powers. And in the field of unmanned armed vehicles, we are even better than the world's top powers. The main focus of our activity is to gain access to strategic weapons in all areas. That would be all areas excluding dirty weapons. The founder of the revolution, Ayatollah Khomeini, frequently condemned WMDs and especially chemical weapons. The kind that killed thousands upon thousands of Iranians during the eight-year war with Iraq. That'll be all for today. Thanks for watching from the whole team. Do tune in again at the same times next week and each week after as you never know what's on. And know this, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram via at Iran Today Show henceforth. Bye for now.